Today's topic is uh, cryptic pathogens. I thought it would be an interesting thing to talk about because recently I had uh, a couple of people talk to me about um, Botrytis scenaria, which is gray mold, for those who don't know. Um, but many people that follow me do know quite a bit what Botrytis is, and um, I was asked uh, whether or not Botrytis was systemic which is a question that I get for powdery mildew all the time, and the answer is that no, powdery mildew uh, is a, um, an epiphyte. Yo, what's up, Jordy? Um, yo, Taco? <laughs> all, the, all Everyone's jumping in at once. Good. Um, so I'm talking about Botrytis, but I'm also going to talk about uh, cryptic pathogens in general, and that would include things like viruses and uh, phytoplasmas, for example. And I think it's a really important um, topic that doesn't, I mean, it doesn't often come up. I think partly because they're cryptic, right? But um, it's also sort of technical, the sort of pathogens that tend to be cryptic. In other words, organisms that can lay dormant for a long time and then suddenly come up out of nowhere, or um, they exist in the plant and maybe even are passed vertically to their progeny, but there's no outward symptoms sometimes, and then sometimes there are, like when they're stressed. Um, so these are the sorts of things that do exist, and they cause a lot of stress because uh, I see that my hair is doing a, the Professor Oak thing with like the up to one side. Maybe that's not totally true. Maybe Professor Oak might not be a good example. But anyways, um, Right, so botrytis. So, um, botrytis, botrytis is a faculative um, endophyte. Uh, what, what that means is that um, sometimes uh, botrytis is able to um, exist inside of the plant for an extended period of time. Um, so, if you've got, uh, an, so if you've got a plant that uh, where in which this is possible. It's not necessarily confirmed in all cases for all plants. However, um, we do know of, or of uh, situations where Botrytis has existed as an endophyte and with asymptomatically, with no symptoms, and then uh, suddenly, sort of like four or five months later, when the plant starts to flower. I think it was in uh, Peony. Peony flowers. I actually have an article up here that goes over this, um, and if you want to find more information, I do have a YouTube video about Botrytis on my YouTube channel, Xenthanol, which is where this live is going to go, actually. Um, I do a weekly, semi-regularly weekly live stream on Instagram, and then uh, I post that on YouTube so that people can have reference to the sorts of things that we talk about, because um, there's always really cool, interesting uh, questions in the comments. Um, so I like to create that discussion and then talk about some sort of subject. People seem to like it, so I've been doing it. <clears throat> Anywho, um, yeah, I, I'm uh, scanning this article for the topic that I was talking about because I want to cite my source. I want to make sure that um, people know that what I'm talking about isn't just out of nowhere. Um, but let's see, let's see, host range, no. Oh, okay, right. So, um, seed borne infection, they describe it as here, um, but it's when the Botrytis is able to act as an endophyte. Um, and they so it says here in the, in the article um, that seed borne infection of Botrytis scenario uh, is reported in, in over 50 hosts. Um, and that includes sunflower, lettuce, flax, um, and there's a 1980 research report by uh, MADA, which um, I could talk about, I suppose, but uh, in this article in particular, if anyone wants to get this information, just send me a comment and I can send the article to you, um, because I'm all about sharing that sort of information for people who want to learn more. Um, but it can be a little bit technical, but it should definitely be something that people, if they're interested in, trying to take a crack at uh, uh, understanding and looking at. Um, seed transmission, so vertical seed transmission to offspring, to progeny in plants of Botrytis, occurs 
and chickpeas, and I guess um, it can cause total crop failure, according to uh, Burgess. Uh, <laughs> gray mold in this crop often begins by rotting of the abrasive stems at ground level, uh, other soft rot lesions, that's not really what I'm looking at. Oh, okay, Barnes and Shaw in 2003 described the occurrence of widespread internal infection of Primula polyantha hybrid plants grown from infected commercial seeds with symptoms of disease only appearing three months after, later after flowering. This apparent endophytic relationship with the host remains to be studied by modern microscopic tools. So we don't really understand all the process that goes into this, but Botrytis is documented to be um, an, an endophyte in some cases, and uh, that's big because if it's the if it's the case for <clears throat> for for other crops that we don't know yet, um, that could be an incredibly important uh, um, you know that's incredibly important to consider for integrated pest management and what your plan is going to be for botrytis because that means that if you do have a crop plant that does get botrytis and botrytis can be endophytic in that plant and in that crop, then um, if you get it, and let's say you're a nursery, and you're, um, you're cutting scions off for like an orchard, or, uh, or whatever, or cannabis for example, um, those plants get botrytis, and it's an endophyte in, those, in that species, then you might be sending that cutting away with botrytis endophytically, systemically in the plant. Um, <laughs> and that's definitely not somebody want, uh, what somebody wants, right? Um, I suppose it might be possible to test for it, um, potentially. The, I'm sure that the technology is there, just whether or not it's um, not expensive enough, or whether or not it's um, economical enough to actually do that. Um, but yeah, cryptic organisms are cryptic, so they're not, they're not very commonly encountered, or um, they're not very commonly observed, more importantly, because they might be encountered just unknowingly, um, which is a subtle but important difference. Um, but there are also other cryptic organisms. Um, for A lot of viruses are cryptic, for example, um, and uh, sometimes what happens is that when a plant is stressed out, the uh, the virus, for example, like the symptoms of being infected by the virus, start to activate. Uh, and there are some there are some pathogens of humans that are kind of like that as well. I suppose herpes is a good example that a lot of people could perhaps uh, have probably heard of, um, and it can kind of work a little bit like that. It's not quite quite like that, but when the um, host is stressed out. Um, uh, herpes activates, for example, uh, and the symptoms are more readily um, observed. And in other plants, you kind of have that as well, where uh, a bacteria or a bacterium or um, a virus or something is basically does nothing until some sort of a stressor comes out, and maybe it's a specific stressor, like for example, maybe a certain um, uh, some sort of pest that's eating the plant might cause a defense mechanism reaction. Um, and maybe that immune response is the trigger. Or maybe it's uh, drought, maybe the fact that the <clears throat> maybe the fact that the plant is dry could uh, set off a uh, reaction or something like that. Um, there are some retrotransposons that can um, They'll incorporate themselves into the plant genome and be passed that way, and then uh, when the plant is under stress, that can be a problem too. So it's it's really pretty it's pretty complex the ways in which um, these sorts of pathogens can stay in the plant. Cha Science asks, does it carry with seeds pulled out of buds with botrytis? Yeah, um, that would be my understanding. Now, and in fact, my understanding would be that it's possible that the, the, the botrytis, even if you were getting foliar botrytis and not, not necessarily botrytis of the inflorescence, you would still have that problem um, where the, uh, the endophytic ingress could happen um, from parent to offspring through vertical transmission. Uh, yeah, that, that would be 
that would be possible. We don't, but we don't know with cannabis in particular. Um, but it's known to happen in lots of plants, so I would assume that that's a very likely possibility until we get confirmation. And I think there might even be confirmation out there already. Um, but yeah, <laughs> um, the medicine tree says waking up the bad genes. I guess you could say so. I guess you could call it that, certainly. It's like, um, that can also be a source of, like, external or exogenous genetic information, too. <coughs> um, the ranch. Hey, Matt. <laughs> hey, Matt. Right. Hey, Adam. Nice to, uh, nice to see you, uh, at, like, what time is it? It's, like, 11.14. <laughs> but I try to have these at different times so people can have an opportunity to, like, interact. Um, I just, I, I decided to do a late one. Glad to see that you're on. Um, uh, yeah, so cryptic organisms, cryptopathogens specifically. So you've got um, different viruses that can do this. Some viruses even incorporate into the genome. Um, but you've also got things like, um, I've talked about this a little bit, but uh, phy what are called phytoplasmas. And uh, hey, fishy, what's up? So phytoplasmas are a particular kind of bacteria. They're a special kind of bacteria that don't have... Um, uh, they don't have a... They're, po they're molecules. Um, and they are... That's a special kind of group where they don't have a cell wall, really. They've got a very pliable, like, cell membrane, and that's their big, um, like, designating taxonomic uh, sort of structure. <coughs> And so, um, phytoplasmas cause a lot of problems for a lot of, a lot of crop plants. Um, they're usually, they're systemic, they systemically infect the plant, uh, very popular, um, and commonly encountered phytoplasma, at least in California and Florida, is huanglong bean or citrus greening disease, um, which is a phytoplasma. And another thing about phytoplasmas is that it's very hard to rear them outside of their hosts. Uh, it's extremely hard, extremely difficult to cultivate them, and sometimes impossible. And uh, when that's the case, it's very hard to describe them, it's very hard to talk about them in any, in any um, sort of substantial way. And it really makes it hard to defend against them because it's very hard to research them. Um, <clears throat> so phytoplasmas are a huge problem. Um, and our understanding of them is sort of limited, although there are some good articles out there that kind of touch on the um, like the like phylogenics of different phytoplasmas and how they fit together and how they're related. Um, but so, what are some examples of phytoplasmas? Well, there's one lung being which causes citrus greening. What does that do? So, it can turn ripe fruit unripe. <laughs> which sucks. Um, it usually causes like a mottled spotting, like a yellow-green <coughs> on the leaves. It's a pretty common um, symptom. Sometimes the fruit, it'll go from ripe to unripe and then unripe to like hard. <coughs> and um, what's another example? Oh, well, it's carried by the, um, the African, Asian, African and the Asian citrusylids, and they are um, vectors for the phytoplasma. Um, and it affects all citrus, all kinds of citrus. There's virtually no resistant um, rootstock for citrus screening, and we're just starting to create a rootstock that can be resistant and develop it and make it, make it uh, available to a whole ton of uh, orchard growers. Um, but it's taken a lot of resources and, and <clears throat> a lot of uh, a lot of research, a lot of um, just work in general. I mean, we've had this problem for like five to almost ten years now. I want to say, at least in Florida, anyways, and it really threatens all of citriculture. Um, and it's kind of funny to me that so many people walk around like, you know, how ubiquitous it is to eat an orange or. <clears throat> Or like have orange juice, right? Like, come on, that's like a, a, that's like an American, like traditional drink for breakfast, right? Orange juice, you know. So, um, 
like the fact that people walk around not realizing that like we're we're like we're like a few really bad infestations away from like huge citrus like overhaul because <laughs> you can't cure it and it kills the orchard it kills the plant in like three years or less or or way way less like at max um so the only way to destroy it is to just destroy the entire orchard and start again that's like that is the cure this is the cure for citrus greening <clears throat> so um it's a big problem so it's a cryptic organism um in that uh it doesn't like you will see the symptoms eventually at least for citrus greening but other phytoplasmas can be a lot more cryptic <coughs> and they're not and endophytes in general whether they are a um whether they are uh pathogenic or they are beneficial they can be cryptic too <coughs> we are just like sorry for coughing so much um i was like talking really loud all day and <coughs> kind of scratched my throat so i thought oh i would do a live feed that's a great idea um so anyways um so uh endophytes in general can we don't realize we have we're just starting to realize like the microbiome in um like the soil microbiome the human gut microbiome other organisms gut microbiomes um and just like the uh, the microbiome inside of a plant as well as in the soil is is um in some cases very uh you could i mean in some cases it's extremely important because we're seeing like 300 different species of microbes for example in one host sometimes not all the time <clears throat> but sometimes and um like I've kind of talked about before, endophytes can be very beneficial to many plants, and um, if you are a plant that doesn't have a really adaptive immune system, like, for example, mammals have, um, you can, I guess, outsource, or think of it as outsourcing their immune system to other organisms that can uh, bolster its defenses. Um, I've talked about Bouveria bassiana, which is an um, it's an entomopathogenic fungus that is used in crop uh, agriculture to kill myriad different plants, or plants, myriad different pests, and it's also been shown to be a faculative endophyte, just like botrytis, for example. Um, and that's really good. That's really good because if you can use that organism and it, and it enters into the plant, and it doesn't reside for the entire life of the plant, it, it appears to last at least in some cases, like with corn, um, like two to three weeks. And it doesn't really. The inoculation points, um, uh, they're not all kind of mutually similar, I suppose. Uh, I could. Again, if somebody wants to read the research on that, I have the articles myself. So, if you wanted to read about how Bouveria bassiana can be an endophyte, if you use Bouveria bassiana or something like that, um, might be something to know. But I think it's a really cool organism for that reason, because in some cases, it will repel organisms before they even try to feed on the plant, which is pretty cool. And I think a lot of people would say that they would definitely want that if they could get that for their... Uh, plants think of it you know that's a true repellent right <clears throat> attack of the grow asks any reports as to what the roots look like on these affected citrus trees after being diagnosed with greening <coughs> um i'm positive that such a thing exists um but i don't remember off the top of my head i'm curious why you ask though um if you could expand on your question like, are you going somewhere? Like, do you think that there might be, like, <coughs> some sort of a, um... I'm sure... Well, the wood the wood gets gnarled. I didn't mention this, but the, the limbs of the plant, um, they will curl and they will gnarl into really, like, terrible, um, twists. And I imagine that the root systems can get that way, too, but I don't know off the top of my head. Um, so I'm curious why you asked. <coughs> If you want to, yeah. So if you want to read about 
the um, Bouveri Bassiana, I'm seeing there's definitely people who are interested in in, uh, in reading about it being an endophyte. I do have videos on my YouTube channel about it too, about endophytism in uh, Bouveri Bassiana. Um, I've written posts about it as well on the endophyte um, hashtag. Um, but yes, if you're interested in the links, send me a message so I don't forget because I'm, I'm not going to remember who's who is saying this right now. So just send me send me a link or just send me a message that's like, hey, I want to get that link for the Bouveri Bastiana for the endophyte or for the Botrytis being an endophyte too. I can send you that article as well. Whatever whatever you're interested in. Green work. Green work for twenty asks or says. I assumed it was more of a surface application, kind of like spring BT or spinosad. Excuse me if I'm mixing those up at the moment. Also, long day, kind of foggy. Yeah, it that that is what it's for. That the the endophytism is not like that's not what it's um, that's not why people buy it. It is mostly for contact spores on contact. That's what it what it. Um, what it excels at but this new well not new but this sort of like <clears throat> alternative ability of Uveri Bastiana can open up some some possibilities there uh, for alternative use or for um, uh, maybe trying to find a way to make it reside longer in the plant or making it or if we find out why it's repellent we might be able to extrapolate that and do something else with it there's a lot of possibilities we just don't know uh, the process exactly and why it happens sometimes and not other times it's probably due to uh, um, it's probably something related to the genotype uh, I mean <laughs> right I guess what I mean by that is um, like uh, a lot of uh, beneficial fungi interactions require um, sort of genetic cues to go back and forth um, so there could be something like that it might just be a compatibility issue and then the question is, well, why is that? So um, I'm looking forward to seeing more research on that, but I have some, and I would love to share it with people who are interested. That's why I do these live uh, feeds, is to disseminate that kind of information. <clears throat> Attack of the Grove says, there have been reports in Vietnam on greening disease. It may be a form of pathogenic nematodes. Um, I don't think so. Um, I do think that um, there are like root nematodes and stem nematodes and root knot nematodes that uh, cause pretty bad, um, almost like disease-like uh, symptoms, but uh, citrus greening is definitely associated with these, um, with these bacteria. Um, but I'd be interested in reading uh, something on it if you have something like that like an article or a, or even like a news thing or something Because that's interesting. I don't want to I'm not trying to be dismissive. I'm just curious um, That's the first time I've heard of that and I've worked with people who do who do research on long beings, so it's um, It'd be interesting to read definitely if you have that um, DSG labs yo, I had to submit my final plans. Oh, okay. Well, I see. Um, yeah, please send me a copy. I would really like to to go over that. Um, yeah, man, totally. Attack of the Gross says, interesting observation when applying the Guveria bassiana was that there seemed to be a mass exodus of root aphids into the runoff. <coughs> root aphid be gone. Um, that's that's been my experience too not every time but um definitely in like sometimes in like pots for example um like in those hemp pots where the roots can sometimes um sort of puncture out um of the fabric sometimes i see root aphids i've seen root aphids on on the rootlets coming out and if they get awash with the Bouveri bassiana then they definitely um don't like that <laughs> and they will they will definitely be molested when that occurs and will vacate. Uh, a quick reach with root knot nematodes and citrus greening pulls up reports. Oh, quick search, I'm guessing is what you meant. Um, okay, well, yeah, well, send, send me something or, or, I'll, or I'll take a look at it too. Yeah, that's the first time I've heard of that. Um, yeah, thanks for bringing that to my attention. 
Very cool. Very cool. See, I'm learning stuff too. That's why it's really important to just have these sorts of live feeds where people can talk about this sort of information. So, so far we've talked about Botrytis scenario being an endophyte, being a cryptic endophyte at that, and then just suddenly springing into pathogenicity like three or four months down the line when the plant starts to flower. <clears throat> And since it's also shown to be uh, vertically transmitted in some cases, up to 50 species in fact, of, and it says here, flax, lettuce, and sunflower, which are very different uh, morphologically uh, and phylogenetically for that matter, so I would not be surprised if it was also true in cannabis and other plants as well. Um, so that's really, uh, really a, a big important thing um, to consider when it comes to your infection with botrytis because maybe what's happening is that if you're a nursery and you're cutting your, your cuttings um, they might be infected with botrytis and you send them off to somebody else and they get the botrytis and that can be a, a biosecurity hazard or a risk rather so I mean how would you fight that though uh, you know that would be sort of difficult um, I don't think that there, the technology is definitely there, but I don't think there's a service that, like that offers um, plating that out. Or maybe there is, I don't, I don't know, um, to be honest. But yeah. Hey, Lost in the, was it Lost in Calaveras? Okay. Yeah. Hey. Um, making reference to the repelling comment. Oh, quick, quick search with the root not nematodes. Yeah, okay. Um, so I talked about botrytis, I talked about phytoplasmas a little bit, like citrus greening disease, but there's also, um, well for example, there's there's a lot of people here that are on the feed um, grow cannabis, so there's cryptic cannabis um, virus, which I have some research on and have talked about a few times, but let me, let me do that. Yeah, okay. Right, right, okay. So I have a research report up here. It's called um, Complete Sequence of a Cryptic Virus from Hemp, Cannabis Sativa. Um, this is dated August, or, or published November 2011. Right. Um, the abstract reads, Hemp, Cannabis sativa was found to be a useful propagation host for hop latent virus, uh, carlovirus. However, when virus preparations were analyzed by electron microscopy, along with the expected filamentous particles, spherical particles with a diameter of about of around 34 nanometers were found. RNA from virus preparations was purified and cDNA was prepared and cloned. Sequence information was used to search databases and the greatest similarity was found with Primula uh, malacoides virus 1, a putative new member of the genus Partitivirus. The full sequences of RNA1 and RNA2 of this new hemp cryptic virus were obtained. So they confirmed uh, this cryptic virus in in cannabis. <clears throat> so, like, um, of course, somebody who cultivates is going to think, well, what is that? Is that going to cause damage? Is that going to cause a, a physiological problem with my plant? Uh, and the answer is, I don't, I don't think I really know the answer to that. Um, one would ostensibly think it would have some effect. Um, but it, if it is a cryptic virus, it's because it doesn't necessarily always have symptoms um, that are that are observable, that are easy to observe, I suppose. So it's also possible that it doesn't really do very much of anything. But the real answer is that we don't know, right? And that's uh, the intellectually honest answer to give. Um, at least as far as I know, again, I don't have access to every single research report out there. So if somebody else comes across something, uh, let me know. Uh, the medicine tree asks, is this when you have been growing something awesome for years and then one day completely shits the bed? Um, that can be what happens. That can be what happens if you had like a, 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 a cryptic uh, pathogen, a ver like a virus maybe, and if it gets stressed out, that can happen for sure. Um, 
but generally not over the span of many, many years, um, I would say. So perhaps not. I would say that would be more attributable to like um, just a loss of vigor from age, which happens in a lot of plants. I mean, uh, plants can take, some plants anyways, can take age a little bit better than humans can. Uh, but definitely age has a, um, a great effect on the vigor of, an, of any individual um, plant. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Greenwork420 says, I'm not familiar with uh, the cryptic, uh, cannabis cryptic virus, I hope. Yeah, I know, I, I hope that you're not also. Um, but, uh, you know, you really don't know. And, it's, and I would not be surprised there's also a there's also a hemp phytoplasma. Uh, I didn't really mention that, I don't think. But let me just be clear: there is a hemp phytoplasma, and some phytoplasma symptoms uh, mirror. Uh, they call it witch's broom, and it's sort of like this like jaggedy, um, uh, sometimes gnarled, but also like um, how would I describe it? Just chaotic vegetative growth. Uh, really abnormal leaf formation is very common in uh, plants that have phytoplasma, sometimes fasciation, which is that that cool, like, um, sort of flattened, but like broad, flattened uh, uh, floral um, shape, right? Um, if I showed a picture, which I'm going to when I edit this video, um, you would know what I'm talking about. It's the sort of like um, shifted flattened uh, inflorescence um, that can be caused by a phytoplasma which often is because it causes a weird hormone imbalance in the plant and even when there's no phytoplasma a weird hormone imbalance can also cause this sort of uh, expression to happen um, so I would not be surprised if plants that have fasciation uh, or plants that have sort of an, a really abnormal and sort of unexplainable random um, vegetative propagation or uh, a growth morphology or leaf morphology. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if a cryptic pathogen were to blame for that. And some people would say, oh, well, but, you know, you can pass, you know, how would that be? Because, you know, I, it's like, it must be a, a genetic thing because the plant um, is passing it along, but a lot of these pathogens can be vertically transmitted to their progeny, so it doesn't necessarily mean that that's not not what's happening. Um, yeah, so or flat stem. The medicine tree mentions flat stem. Yeah, that's also fasciation too. So um, you know that would not be surprising. It's, it's been the case in other plants, so there's precedent, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was also the case here. Yeah, fasciation observed during flower is really cool. Definitely. Um, I, I think it's very pretty. And in horticulture, it's very common for people to um, uh, take cuttings of it and sort of propagate that if they can. Um, because people also find it very attractive, sometimes very alien. Um, at least, in my opinion, I find it very attractive specifically because it looks so odd. Um, and so do other people. So uh, entrepreneurial folk will recognize that and try to keep that going on if they can. Uh, let's see. Greenwork420 says, I've seen what I think you're describing only on pretty inbred stock as well as hybrids between two pretty inbred lions. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to be due to a, a cryptic pathogen either, but there is that association. Uh, because ultimately, fundamentally, they do the same thing to the plant physiology, which is cause a weird um, genetic or hormonal change to the plant. But it can just be a genetic uh, uh, mutation all by itself, without any sort of pathogenic influence. Um, which is, again, just a really cool thing in general, but um, I think that, like, there's this, there's this story that I've told before a few times um, about poinsettia. Um, basically, there was a, a, a single branching cultivar, or essentially um, 
traps, like, like, yeah, cultivar is supposed to be the right term. That was the trait that they were, that it had. And then suddenly they found this multi-branching uh, um, cultivar, and uh, it was very helpful for um, cutting clones for the poinsettias for, for propagation. So they bred it. They thought it was just a random mutation, but they found out 10 years later that this new uh, cultivar essentially is, is the physiological damage or disease of a phytoplasma that um, just infected the plants and caused this weird abnormality. The plants grew pretty much fine. There was really no no problem as far as they were concerned, but as far as the cultivators were concerned, uh, the plants weren't particularly worse off with pests and disease and all this other stuff. So they just took it and cultivated it and they just continued to. But the way they found out the way they found out that it wasn't that there might be something funky going on was partly because phytoplasmas became more of a thing in horticultural science, but also because uh, I guess they exposed the plant to antibiotics for some reason, and the antibiotics were antibacterial, like most antibiotics, and they uh, killed the phytoplasma that was inside, and so and so the plant reverted. Uh, the cult, the way that it was growing would revert back to regular branching. So that's kind of an interesting story. And um, I bring it up because that's an interest, that's something to, to consider when you see a new trait. I know people want to think, oh, this was a thing that I did, or oh, this, I mean, it's not that it necessarily isn't any less so something that somebody did or cultivated. But, you know, um, the, just the mere fact that these things exist calls into every question, you know, it calls into question every time somebody says, oh, like, this is a new trait that I made, um, because maybe it's not, I mean, maybe it's not genetic, rather, it's not genetic with the plant, it could be something that's caused by a pathogen. Uh, Attack of the Grow asks, is this cryptic virus different from the mosaic? I assume you mean, like, tobacco mosaic virus? Are you familiar with the vectors of infection? Yeah, so for Toboma viruses, um, which are named after tobacco mosaic virus, uh, Toba, Tobama viruses, they're very resilient viruses. Um, that group is um, commonly spread through uh, just touch. Um, it is possible, uh, people, not everyone knows this, but it is possible for tobacco uh, from cigarettes to still be infectious and somebody who like is smoking a cigarette might inadvertently uh, touch a plant that's susceptible to, to, to tobacco mosaic virus and spread it um, which is pretty amazing to me to be honest um, equipment also can be a, a source of vector but also can thrips thrips are um, they are also vectors, or at least some species are vectors of um, various Tobama viruses. And then there's also there's tobacco mosaic virus, which is like the um, like the type species essentially of the Tobama viruses. Obviously, it's also the namesake, so that's probably not surprising. Oh yeah, aphids. Um, aphids are also uh, vectors of many different viruses and other pathogens as well. Um, in general, they just, yeah, they just screw things up, don't they? Vectors of all things needing to be killed with fire. I mean, yeah, I suppose. You know, you might be surprised to find out that, like, for example, uh, and this isn't related to plants necessarily, but, um, uh, so mosquitoes, some mosquitoes can carry, uh, malaria, right? So it turns out that actually malarial infection is also really terrible for mosquitoes. It is not good for their health at all. It's um, it, it causes problems with um, with mating. It causes problems. It's it's like it's like having really bad like um, like intestinal worms essentially. Like it just screws up their physiology a lot. Um, 
we'd actually be doing them a favor if we were able to like wipe out all of the malarial mosquitoes, um, as long as it didn't kill the entire all the species, right? But if we we're able to like wipe out malarial uh, malaria from the population, it would actually be doing them a favor, and it would be doing us a favor. So um, I bring it up because uh, I don't know, like. There's probably a, a way besides genocide to do that. In a crop situation, though, you, you're kind of, kind of not given that liberty. But it is a um, definitely an important part of biosecurity because if you have a plant, if you if you're in an area where you're growing a crop where uh, that vector, that organism, is in the area. And you know it is a competent, what's called a competent vector for the pathogen, meaning it's a, it's a vector that uh, can vector. It's it's an organism that can vector the virus, um, uh, commonly. You know, it's it's competent. So, not that it's thinking to do this, but it's just that's just the terminology. Anywho, um, and if you know that those organisms are in the area, and if you know that your plants are susceptible to certain viruses that those organisms vector, then it becomes a way, way, way higher stakes game of keeping those organisms from getting into your plants. Or, at the very least, keeping them from being in the plants for very long if it's impossible to keep them out entirely. Um, viruses cause so much damage to agriculture in general, and um, it's very hard to deal with them so very often people don't even try. People don't like make an effort to sort of, I'm not saying that there isn't, there aren't efforts to change things, it's just that it is very difficult to do. So um, it is not always the case that, that you're going to get your monies back from the research efforts. Not that that's a reason to not do research, it's just that that's the reality of the situation, unfortunately. Greenworks says, uh, Mosaic and cannabis, I'm all ears. I thought the jury was out on that still. Do you think mosaic virus is responsible for the higher rate of variegation in cannabis? Uh, no, actually, um, what did I see that was related? Oh, it was related to hemp streak virus, uh, maybe. Yeah, I had this other article, um, and it says, not the one, but the only one about cannabis cryptic virus in plants showing hemp streak disease symptoms, since you mentioned variegation. Uh, and now this was published in um, 2017, so it's quite new. And the abstract reads as such. Uh, intravenal chlorosis and leaf margin wrinkling are widespread symptoms of cannabis sativa. Symptoms of cannabis sativa, that's weird. <laughs> That's a weird sentence. Um, I'm not sure what they mean by that. Maybe it's a typo. Because this is from... Um, uh, these researchers are from... I can see that the names are quite... One of them's from Italy. Other one's from Germany. And... Yeah, two people from Italy and one person from... Three people from Italy. Okay. Yeah, I think they might have uh, mistyped something there. They are traditionally attributed to the so-called hemp streak virus, but its existence has not been demonstrated yet. To our knowledge, no molecular investigation has so far been performed in order to identify the causal agent of this symptom symptomatology. We therefore decided to use traditional and molecular virology techniques to better characterize symptoms and pursue the etiological agent. No pathogenic virus was found by using targeted PCR reactions and by RNA sequencing, whereas we were able to detect the cannabis cryptic virus with both techniques. We therefore developed an RTQ-PCR assay based on the cannabis cryptic virus specific TACMAN probe and applied it to a wide range of symptomatic and symptomless plants using a two-step for quantification or a one-step for fast detection protocol. Both symptoms and the virus were only shown to be transmitted vertically and did not pass via mechanical inoculation or grafting, though we could not find any cause-effect correlation between them. In fact, 
The virus was found in all the tested hemp samples, and its abundance varied greatly between different uh, accessions and individuals, independently from the presence and severity of symptoms. The suggestion that hemp streak is, a, is caused by a virus is therefore questioned. Some abiotic stresses seem to play a role in triggering the symptoms, but this aspect needs further investigation. For breeding purposes, a selection of parental plants based on the absence of symptoms proved to be efficient in containment of the disease. So, what does that mean? That means that um, uh, some people blame uh, variegation or um, uh, intravenal chlorosis on hemp streak, on hemp streak virus, also on um, uh, tobacco mosaic virus, for example, um, and possibly other viruses too. But, and they thought that perhaps cannabis cryptic virus is the causal agent because maybe that that is the symptom or possibly a symptom under certain situations like when the plant is stressed. Of course, it seems like that is not the case according to this document. Uh, it seems like um, it could be a disease that's not caused by a biological organism. It could be an abiotic disease um, or maybe a genetic disease. Um, it's not really known what causes that variegation. Um, yeah, so specifically it says that, uh, yeah, the suggestion that hemp streak is caused by a virus is questioned. Um, so we don't really know. We don't really know what causes it. Um, but it's possibly not even a biological organism which I think a lot of people, uh, for, right, for a good reason, because it's not always the case, um, and most people imagine like a biological organism that they have to destroy or, or kill or something, but there are cases where you have diseases that are abiotic, and those are some of the worst ones to have to deal with for a lot of reasons. Um, but yeah, I guess sometimes that's just how it goes. Sometimes you don't even have a, a pathogen to cure. Sometimes it's a genetic disease, or sometimes it's just a weird mutation that causes a problem. Um, yeah, and also the sort of wrinkling as well that I've seen some people talk about. I've definitely seen, oh, there's pictures here too. Um, here, why don't I, I can do that, right? Okay, let's, let's switch here. Okay, yeah. So, um, this is figure one. It says, figure one, scale of symptoms of intravenal chlorosis and leaf wrinkling, ranging from one, which is no symptoms, to four, symptoms spread on the whole leaf. Um, so one is a healthy leaf, or A. Um, B has a little bit more of the uh, intravenal chlorosis. We have a little bit more of the chlorosis and the leaf wrinkling, and then we have full-scale chlorosis and uh, leaf wrinkling. And um, yeah, so that's what they're talking about here when they when they refer to hemp streak. And it's really important that they are good about this. That they actually, um, you know, they have a picture. They have a picture, and they have something that like shows what they're talking about, so that like. <laughs> So that you're not just like using words because sometimes that can be misinterpreted, right? It's very important to have pictures and documentation. And it also makes it helpful to talk about, like I'm doing here. Um, but yeah, so that's those are cryptic organisms. Um, I guess we talked about a few of those, botrytis, phytoplasmas, and various viruses. There are other organisms, there are endophytes that uh, are kind of, they can be neutral, they can be pathogens, they can be uh, beneficial, uh, but sometimes they just don't really have observable symptoms that are obvious at least. Um, and sometimes they are more obvious when you sit down in a lab and you do certain tests and figure out some things and maybe doing a, a bioassay on the plant just like you would for maybe for a pathogen is the only way you would even detect that they were there in the first place. 
So, in other words, like, your eyes aren't the be-all, end-all. Um, there are things that can be a problem that we just can't detect by looking. Um, you know, try as, we, try as we might in as romantic a picture as it is to be the, the farmer that can, like, grab the piece of soil and take a sniff and be like, no, this will be a good season. This is good soil. You can really smell it, you know, like, no, like... That's great. It's a romantic interpretation. However, um, there are just some things that you can't like perceive with your normal eyes, and um, unaided, you will be in a, a world of pain if you happen to get a virus that like just destroys your crop, or a fungus that just will destroy and eradicate everything. It's a, it's an invisible enemy, and you you can't fight it. Uh, without help, without without science on your side, and without people who are specialists that are able to come in and, and, and evaluate and, and advise you. So, yeah, extrapolate data, as, as Nixo Live says. And um, I think that that's going to be it. Um, I don't really have anything more to say. I wanted to keep it somewhat shorter. It makes editing easier. Uh, um, but yeah, for everyone who's on here, this video will be on my YouTube channel, Xenthanol. Go check it out. Um, like my videos, subscribe to my videos, but only if you like them. Don't do it if don't do it if you don't like the video. I, I appreciate um, all of the input, all of the positive feedback that I've been getting from people lately on YouTube, also on Instagram. Um, I think my video production has has definitely it's tripled or quadrupled. Um, recently because of a lot of the positive work um, from other people, a lot of the, um, the help both financially and also just in general, just the positive feedback, the good input, um, people telling me what they like, what are the things that are relevant to them, because it's not helpful if I'm just making things that people aren't going to find relevant. Uh, things related to pests and pathogens, people have been telling me they really appreciate having a lot of that free information. Um, which is phenomenal because I think that's very important that people have such a great fundamental basis for cultivation knowledge and pests and pathogens are my thing. It's what I do my work with. It's, uh, you know, it's what I do. So I want to give back and make sure that people have access to it, even if they can't necessarily afford like um, like a like a um, consulting visit from somebody or anything like that. Um, because people who are passionate and understand and know what they're talking about and know what they're doing, um, I mean, this stuff is possible to be understood by people who aren't, like, uh, you know, PhDs or anything like that, but um, it is information that is sort of esoteric and hard to come across and hard to compile sometimes, so it's really helped me a lot to get help from all of you guys for doing that compiling and putting it all together in a format in a way that people can digest easily. So I thank you for that. Um, well, thanks, Nixo. Seriously appreciate the level of detail you put into your post. Well, you're, you're very welcome. I, um, I didn't think that people would be super into it at first, but, um, I was proven wrong and I'm glad to have been. And I hope that I can go on, um, helping other people and, and making good connections and things like that. So I'll talk to all of you later. Have a good one.